So we're figuring out our second variable, which was y. So we're on to d2. And we got that from the original coefficient matrix with the second. So the second column right here is the constant column swapped in. So that's how we got this matrix. So let's go ahead and get the determinant. When in doubt, just expand on the first row. And then you always have the plus, minus, plus. So our first is 2 times negative 3, 4, 4, negative 3, minus 3 times the determinant, negative 1, 4, 1, negative 3, plus negative 1 times the determinant, minus 1, minus 3, 1, 4. So it's 2 times 9 minus 16. Be careful with your negative signs. Minus 3 times 3 minus 4, minus 1 times negative 4, plus 3. So we got negative 14 plus 3 plus 1. Negative 10. So there's our second determinant. <coughs> and of course, we're going to bring this back over to, so it's negative 10. We're going to bring this back over to our d2 over d. And I think d was 15, our original determinant. Nope, it was 5. So negative 10 over 5 is negative 2. So there's our y is negative 2. And last up, we're going to get our d3. So this time, we have third column is going to be swapped out with constants. So our first two are, columns are the originals. So the first column is 2, negative 1, 1. Second column, 1, 2, negative 2. And const constant column is taking the third column position, neg uh, 3, negative 3, 4. And we'll compute D3 the same going across uh, row 1. So our third determinant is 5. And this goes, let's see, this is our x3 is 5 over 5, which of course is 1. So our z is positive 1. So we got our x, y, and z now. And put them together written as a point. x, y, z. z is 1. y is negative 2. x is 3. So there's our final answer to put all together. So Kramer's rule, <coughs> what was the condition I told you about Kramer's rule, if it would be applicable or not? 
So we definitely have to have square <laughs> matrix. There is uh, somewhere else. There we go. So that was super important. I'll highlight that. <coughs> so the term of A is not 0. So that's the condition it has to meet in order to use the uh, Kramer's rule. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that right there. And then we'll be moving on after this. So if I read it out in linear algebra form, we have a coefficient matrix A. And remember, the x matrix was usually has just x, y, z in it, whatever your variables are going down in a column. And then B is constant matrix. So if determinant A is not 0, then we know Kramer's rule is applicable. Uh, but also, what does this tell us about, if you know your determinant is not 0, what does it tell you about A being invertible or not? Or did I not go over that yet? That was a fast, fantastic time to go over this. All right, so if your determinant is not 0, then A is invertible. Now, it also turns out that if determinant A is not 0, then Kramer's rule is applicable. So those are both the consequence of determinant not being 0. Wouldn't that be because 0 can't be inverted? Or would that just mean? Well, with matrices, is a little more complicated than that. But what it will mean if your uh, determinant is 0, you won't be able to get the, if you did row operations, you would not be able to get down to this. Okay. So if your determinant is 0, that means you, uh, you would not be able to get to here. Okay. And of course, if you're thinking in a linear system, you have x, y, z equals some constants. This means right here, x is c1, y is c2, and z is c3. Uh, so <coughs> if your determinant is not 0, that means you're, you can do row operations and get here. Uh, so this is really important. If the term is not 0, then you have an invertible matrix. Uh, so in row operations, it means you'll be able to get down to this here at the bottom. But what I want to look at is the AX equals B. All right, if you can invert A, that means I can multiply both sides by A inverse. So we have the identity times x equals B, oops, equals A inverse B. And the identity times x is just x. So if it's invertible, what that means is you can solve for x, meaning you can solve for the variables x, y, and z. So there will be one solution. So this means x has exactly one solution. And that's going to be a point, and it's a zero-dimensional intersection. If you think about how these planes would be intersecting, they would be intersecting at a point right here. So now we're going to go, <coughs> we're going to skip 8.6 and we'll come back to that. But I want to jump into 8.7. So 8.7 is nonlinear systems. So we just finished linear algebra and matrices, which are linear systems. So now we're going to look at nonlinear systems. So first thing to notice, the word nonlinear 
what that means is you cannot use a matrix. So matrices only work for linear systems. So that means everything we just learned in chapter 8 won't apply to nonlinear. So how do we solve them? We're going to basically just use algebra. So we got two choices. These two also work for linear systems. Uh, the two choices are elimination or substitution. Now all these systems we're going to look at, we're going to solve over the real numbers. So if there are complex solutions, we're not going to worry about those. So we're going to solve over the real numbers, not over the complex numbers. So what that means is if you get down to some situation, you get x squared equals negative 4, you'll know that there is no real solution for this. So if you get to some point where you get x squared is negative or something like this, then you would say no real solution in this case. Now, of course, x squared is positive 4. There would be 2 and negative 2. That would work. But this is an example of no, uh, an equation not having a real solution. So we're just going to do examples in this section. So we know that this system is nonlinear because it appears in section 8.7. How else would you know this was not linear if all you got was the system? It's got squareds. So if everything is first powers, then you have a linear system. And if you have square, square roots, cube, any power that's not one or a constant term, then you have a nonlinear system. So this is nonlinear for all those powers right there. If it just had one of those powers, it would not be linear. All right, so from here, <coughs> we have two ways to solve it, elimination or substitution. I think either one is equally valid. It's pretty easy to solve for x squared in either equation. So I can solve for that x squared very easily and plug it in at the top. Let's instead go for elimination. What's a good move for elimination? It'd be hard to get rid of the y's because I'd have to multiply the second equation. I could do that by multiplying it by y and then subtracting. But that's going to introduce some extra y's. How can I get the x's out with elimination? So just <coughs> yep, take row, basically subtract them. Either first row minus second row, second row minus first row. Doesn't matter which way you go. Uh, let's go ahead and just subtract the two equations. You can think of these as row operations, but you can't put them into a matrix and do all those, uh, do what you're used to because there is no way to represent x squared and y squared. So you got to be a little bit careful. Uh, but we're definitely doing elimination here, so we're subtracting. Let's go subtract like this. So we have 0x squared plus y squared plus y equals 13 minus 7. So you have to subtract everything, not just some of the terms. So we're taking away every single term in the second equation. So any questions on this elimination step right here? How many solutions does this equation have for y? How many potential solutions? What degree is this polynomial? Two. Two. So how many solutions are we expecting maximum? <coughs> Two. Two. So go ahead and find them. This is just a quadratic. 
you will have either uh, zero, one, or two solutions. Your first step should be get all the terms on one side. So solve for zero, and then tell me what y needs to be. And this is algebra one, probably, maybe algebra two. So we have two y values, positive 2 and negative 3. You could have gone complete the square. You could have gone uh, quadratic formula. It doesn't matter as long as you're careful. So any algebra questions on these two y values? Could you have, um, instead of uh, subtracting the 6 on the other side, could you have, uh, no, never mind. You could, I was going to say factor out a y. I can definitely factor out a y, but you want to be careful. You better be really good at numbers if you're going to tell me the solution is 2 and negative 3 at this point. I couldn't figure out how to tell you that. It's hard to pick two numbers to multiply to make 6 because there's an infinite number of choices. Two numbers multiplying to make 0 is a different story. It means 1 or both are 0. But multiplying to make 6, there's nothing special about 6. I picked good numbers, so it was 2 and negative 3, but it could have been square root 17 and something else that was crazy. All right, we are not done. All we did was get two y values. So let's look back at the original. How many dimensions is our problem written in? How many variables? Two. So that means my answer better have x value and y value. All I have is y values right now. So I need to figure out what x values match up with these. And here's the tricky part. There are two choices for y. So I have to, on one side, assume y is 2, and then figure out what x is. On the other side, I have to forget all that stuff and figure out when y is negative 3, what does x have to be? So we're basically solving two separate problems down here. So y equals 2. I'm going to rewrite my original equations. With y as 2 now. So I'm not going to write all the y's in here. I'm just going to write 2 in for y. So my first equation, x, uh, x squared plus 2 squared equals 13. Second equation, x squared minus 2 equals 7. Now I'm rewriting originals with, so rewrite with y equals negative 3. So I have x squared plus negative 3 squared equals 13. And x squared minus negative 3 equals 7. So there are now two separate problems. I'll work on the left side first and forget about the right for a minute. So how do we solve for x? Basically just subtract or add that constant to the other side. So if we look at the first equation, x squared equals 13 minus 4, which is something 9. Is that right? So there's our first equation, solve for x. So we have x squared equals, or x equals plus or minus 3. I could do the same thing on the second equation, and I better get to the same x values. x squared equals 7 plus 2, which is 9. And then I'm right back to plus minus 3. So any algebra questions on the left side? The way we write our answers, 
So down here, I have to pay attention to x and y values. y is 2. x is either negative 3 or positive 3. So we'll go with the negative 3 first. So minus 3, 2. And positive 3, 2. So you're writing as points, x comma y. So over here, we said y was 2. So each of these points has a y value of 2. And then the x value, what we just got. So there's two solutions right there. And now, I want you to figure out the x values that satisfy these equations. It'll probably be very similar. And then at the bottom, when you write your points, make sure you use negative 3 as your y value. So you should get your x values at plus and minus 2. And then you need to pair them up with the correct y value. Our y was negative 3. What you don't want to do is go and grab the y value on the wrong side and bring it down. So make sure you don't do that. So there's our four solutions right there. Now all that nice geometry I talked about with planes, lines, intersecting, Things get crazy when they're not linear anymore. So you can have weird curves like this, and then things intersecting in weird numbers of times. So there isn't really any geometric intuition as to what intersections are going to look like. And how could we tell that we were going to have four? We had no way to know how many solutions we were going to have. The only thing we could really tell is that solutions were going to be x comma y, because my variables were x and y. It's also possible to have zero solutions, meaning the curves never intersect. So most of these nonlinear equations are going to be in two dimensions. So the first equation, x squared minus y squared equals 4. And the second equation is y equals x squared. You could absolutely go elimination. But in order to do elimination, we'd really have to get our x squared term on the other side. So let's go substitution instead on this system. You can use either one. Let's go with substitution. Now we're going to do something a little bit strange. I could take, I have y equals x squared. So I could very carefully plug in x squared and then square it when I plug it in. So that would be a reasonable move. And I'll show you what that would look like. So substitution, if I solve for y, is very easy. It's already solved for. And then plug in into the first equation. So we've got x squared minus. Now, fortunately, I have y is x squared. And then I have to square it. So this leaves me with x squared minus x to the fourth equals 4. So we just have a fourth degree polynomial. So absolutely, you could keep going and solve this. You do know how to uh, solve de uh, degree 4 polynomials. The way you would do it is I like my uh, highest degree term to be positive. So I'll uh, add x to the fourth the other side, subtract x squared. So we have this equation right here. 
Um, there is a useful, you can do a, u subs or a change of variable, a u substitution, let u equal x squared. So we have 0 equals u squared minus u plus 4. And you can solve for u pretty easily. You just have a quadratic. <coughs> All right, I want to substitute in a slightly smarter way that doesn't give me degree 4. There is a better way to substitute. So what's a different substitution I can make here? x squared equals uh, 4 plus y squared. So what can I replace this x squared by? y. Why can I use y? Because the next line says x squared is y. So I'm going to take out x squared and replace it with a lower degree term, meaning I will have, instead of degree 4, I'll have a degree 2 polynomial. And we're experts at this point at degree 2s. So let's go ahead and make substitution in that way. So it's a little strange. We're basically solving for x squared, which is already done for us. And then we're going to plug in this x squared, or y, in for x squared. So that's the way we're going to go about it. So we have y minus y squared equals 4. And then this is a quadratic, so go ahead and solve for y. It should be pretty routine. I like my y squared is positive. So what can we say about this particular solution for y? So what does that negative sign inside the square root tell us? This is the term. What does that term mean? Complex. complex. So what we get is no real solution. So both of these solutions are complex. So we, don't, we did not get a real solution, so we'll say no solution to this problem. You would get something very similar. You basically have the same polynomial over here on the right side. You would get no real solution for you. So you would get the same outcome over there going the other way. We have our last problem of the section. It'll also be the most complicated.
All right, what are any ideas how to get started with this? So, yeah, two choices, elimination or substitution. So we're going to try elimination. What could I get rid of here? So I could get rid of y squared and get down to y, but the problem is I have an extra y hanging out right here. So I can get rid of the y squareds, but I'll have some trouble with the regular y term. Is it possible to get rid of the x's? Could you split 3xy? Could you factor the y out of 3xy? So we're going to try to factor the y out. So we could try to either solve for x or for y. That would be a reasonable move to make. Probably the second. If we're going to solve for x or y, the second equation might be better to do that with, because there's only just x once and y once in the second equation. So let's go ahead, substitution. And let's solve for x right here. So we can solve for x, but it's going to be a little bit ugly when we plug it back in. And the other issue is we have a positive and a negative version. So when we substitute it in, we're going to have two separate equations that we're going to make, one for the positive, one for the negative. So we operate on the second equation. So what we're going to do is plug this into the first equation. I'll go with the positive first. So we'll use positive 1 third square root 10 minus 4 y squared. So we have 3 times 1 third square root 10. So that's 3xy minus 2y squared equals negative 2. So this looks a little scary. Let's work through it slowly. 3 times a third is going to cancel out to 1. Square root 10 minus 4y squared times y minus 2y squared equals negative 2. All right, that square root's a little bit scary. I could square it out, but what happens if I square both sides now? I'm going to have to foil out something horrible on the left. So what I'm going to do instead is isolate the square root. So we're going to add 2y squared to the other side. And now divide by y. So when I square in this form, the square root is going to just disappear. 
So square both sides. 10 minus 4y squared equals 2y squared minus 2 squared over y squared. So foiling the numerator, we have 4y to the fourth. We have an inside-outside term, and they're both going to be minus 4y squared. So that's minus 8y squared plus 4 divided by y to the fourth. Why would you say divided by y to the fourth? Y to the fourth. Oh, there should be a y squared. Yeah, we just took y and squared it, so it's just y squared. All right, how do we get out of this mess? How are we going to solve for y here? Um, could you multiply by y squared? Yeah, fractions still suck. Multiply by y squared. So we get 10y squared minus 4y to the fourth equals 4y to the fourth minus 8y squared plus 4. All right, I see some, oh no, we don't get nice cancellation here, unfortunately. So do your best to solve for y. There could be up to four solutions here, because we have a degree four polynomial. So do your best to solve for y. Get zero on one side. I think you can divide everything by 2, yeah. So I'm going to change variables so I don't have a degree 4 polynomial anymore. I have a degree 2 in the variable u. And from here, let's use quadratic formula. A1 minus 32 to 49? Yep. Oh, sweet. All right. So we got 9 plus or minus 7 over 8. So there are two choices. 9 minus 7 over 8, which is 1, 2 eighths. 2 eighths. Don't you get negative 9 minus 7? Uh-oh. No. Because it's negative. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Right. All right, 2 eighths, which is 1 fourth. And the other one is... 9 and 7, 16 eighths, which is 2. And you have to make sure you go back into x's. So x, uh, x squared equals 1 fourth. x is plus or minus square root 1 fourth, which is plus or minus 1 half. And the other one, x is plus or minus square root 2. All right, so I'll finish this problem off tomorrow.